<laughs> Hello and welcome. Thank you very much uh, for coming here today. Um, I'm not going to pretend that there is a theme magically uh, um, bringing these books together, because uh, there isn't. But who knows? We may well find this evening that there are certain similarities, echoes, um, or um, uh, who knows, paranormal perhaps, paranormal uh, <laughs> connections uh, between, these, uh, between these works. So the way we're going to work it is, is I'm going to do a short uh, interview of about 15 minutes with, uh, with the, each of the authors. Um, and uh, then after that, um, I'm going to throw it open to the floor, because there are a, a lot of dense rich themes here, and uh, we could spend many hours talking about this, so the authors have kindly agreed to be as uh, pithy and as focused as is possible in these circumstances. Uh, but it is a great pleasure to have all four of them uh, here. Uh, personally, it is a particular pleasure to see Fatos Lubonia here, because I have known uh, Fatos for uh, many years now, and I'm going to start uh, with Fatos by dint of the fact he gets first place in my book because he had to spend 17 years in jail for a, a crime which he didn't commit, in fact the crime didn't exist, uh, and uh, so I think that he deserves first place as a consequence of, of, of that. Um, he, his writing has been recognized throughout uh, Europe. He's a political commentator, a social commentator, and uh, who, who's written also a lot about uh, Albania's uh, troubled past. Um, and uh, as I say, I, I read the book in manuscript, I don't know when it was, about 10 years or so ago, uh, and it was absolutely fantastic. So I was thrilled when I heard that I.B. Taurus was going to publish this uh, in English. It's ex existed in English uh, in a long time because there is something endlessly compelling uh, about uh, people who come under the wheels of uh, arbitrary state repression. Um, it's, it's something which you recognize the mechanisms from country to country, uh, but they each have their own cultural peculiarities. Um, and Albania is a country which, after the late 1940s, was uh, almost entirely inaccessible to people uh, from uh, outside. So it was a European country that bordered on uh, Greece and Yugoslavia, places where all Europeans uh, went on holiday. It's just 40 miles away from from Italy, uh, and yet it was a, a complete mystery to most Europeans. And I would say partly as a consequence of the mystery of that last 50 years, it also remains something of a, a mystery uh, today as well. Um, and Fatos's work is going to help us to try and understand that mystery. As I say, it was a mystery for most Europeans. For most Albanians, it was a misery. Um, and for Fatos in particular, as you'll hear from his story, he's a very elegant writer, Fatos. And amazingly, he writes about this uh, dreadful subject um, with uh, a, a delightful sense of humor, uh, I would like to say. Mm -hmm. The occasional wry remarks which actually make you laugh out loud. So, Fatos, let's uh, focus on your story. Tell us about the day of your arrest, when it was, what you were doing, whether you expected it, and why it happened. Okay. Uh, but this is before the second sentence. It's so before it's, uh, the second maybe, sentence, I know. <laughs> it's, uh, I know. It's better to tell the first sentence. <laughs> yes, tell us the, the first sentence. Uh, just a few the, words. Uh, the first sentence. You know, what's, what I rem remind is that uh, it was, uh, I was at my parents' place out of Tirana, and they knocked at 5 o'clock. And they asked me, some people, uh, my mother was scared, and she said, hey, I want her father's son, said, 
And generally they use these cars, Soviet cars, we call them gas, gas. And I entered two men told me that we have to sell you to Tirana. There are some questions. They didn't tell me anything else. And it was something like one hour from Tirana, the road. I was trying to make some questions to understand what's going on. And then we entered in the main police station of Tirana. And there I tried to see what's going on, and then I needed to piss. And I said, I, I just, and I thought I could go, and normally, like everyone who goes to the toilet alone, but I saw the guy behind that were following me. And when I entered there, they were looking, what, what was it? And I said, this is, seems strange. And, and it seems that I was waiting for the main investigator to come, because it was very too early, and just what I remind is that uh, two men in front of me, I was very young, 23, you know, and uh, I entered inside, General Albanian shake hands, and I didn't see any hand from long, so, and, and fresh, and then, we want you to tell us what are your political opinions. And, my first answer was just, I felt somehow afraid. What, what, how could I tell them my political opinions? And my, my answer was, it, fall, it falls like a bomb, this question to me. Uh, like a bomb should fall, they saw. And then I, I said, like all other. People just, <laughs> you know, within the, when we were children, we were told that you should not be out of the group of the group, and so because the wolf eats mm. you, and just I was you know, like, oh, that, and, um, and this was the fear, so to be out of the group, and this I remember quite well, and then they turned out of a cassette or downstairs they had uh, some writings, my handwritings, which, just to make the short, long story short, were hidden in the roof of the house of my uncle, who was already arrested, but we didn't know, I didn't know. And uh, there were diaries and a short novel and some poetry that were personal things, they were not published. And this was, uh, uh, considered um, by them after, so they wanted why they have been hidden and uh, why. So why this was? Um, I thought I knew that it was uh, something dangerous. The story is linked with the story of my father, who already was accused as an enemy of people after being a member of Central Committee, and uh, so he was declared enemy, and then they have started the interrogate the, the process to, uh, they call it the elaboration process in Albania, which the Secret Service uh, starts to investigate about you. So and they could find the, the the files. Now I know the names of people who were somehow after many years I, who contributed for that, and it was considered agitation and propaganda against the regime from three to 10 years, and I was sentenced seven years for these writings, and this is the story that my first, it, which is not in the second sentence. Yeah, that was, exactly, <laughs> that, was his, uh, that was his first arrest, and to put it into context, there was a very, very brief flowering of liberalism in Albania mm -hmm. in 1971. Uh, I was told when I first went to Albania that you can identify this because the only pop song uh, that uh, people knew in Albania was Mungo Jerry's In the Summertime, which was number one in the sort of five weeks of Albanian liberalism when uh, everyone listened to it. And Fatos's father uh, was without question on the liberal side of the Albanian party inside the Central Committee. Uh, and so, in a sense, Fatos was collateral, a collateral victim mm -hmm. of the struggle that was going on in the Albanian party. So uh, there he is. He's, a, he's been arrested for the, f for the first time. For him, it came out of the blue, the whole thing. Um, 
What about the se second sentence? I mean, you you then you then go to jail, and yeah. it's a pretty miserable experience, isn't it? Yeah, of course. It was a. Uh, there were two kind of penitents in uh, in Albania at that time. Uh, most useful was uh, forced labor, but camp. So it was a copper mine. And, in the central north of Albania, we were working with three shifts. I found the, the camp with something like uh, 400 prisoners, and after seven years, it became uh, 1,500 because it was the year 70s when it happens the second sentence as well. And it was a time of the paranoia of Enver Hoxha, and uh, so. Generally, the atmosphere was terrible because they had started the so-called experience of second sentences. So before it didn't exist in the 70s, Albania, uh, in Albanian prison, it was included this way to to condemn people for a second time, uh, just with for agitation and propaganda generally. But uh, the story of this book is more complex, and uh, to put it in a um, European context. I could say, or Eastern European context, to make a comparison between Albania and other Eastern countries, I could say it was 98, 99, so, sorry, 78, 79, the time when Albania broke with China and remained totally isolated. It's the time when uh, you know, Havel was writing the 77 chart and maybe was condemned for two years or something, you know. In Albania, two prisoners, uh, journalists, who are the main, uh, the main heroes of this book, uh, sent a letter to the Central Committee against Enver Hoxha, against, so trying to give an answer to this situation where Albania was breaking with China. It was a severe letter. I, haven't, I have not yet read the letter. And for that letter, they, uh, I don't know, even this is not yet known how they decided, but they were so angry that they... they and they, they were prisoners with you? They were prisoners. They had already done 16 years, from 64 to till... till uh, so they were in the copper mine with you? They the, were in the copper mine with, with three you. shifts working or even on Sundays. And, and this guy sent this letter. And for this letter, they wanted, to, they decided to condemn them, uh, to, 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 to kill them somehow, to, to, for death sentence. And in order to, 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 to realize that, uh, they needed an article of the penal code because everything was done, uh, was done uh, legally, <laughs> in, in that regime, and. Uh, the article was found that they found was the creation of a contra-revolutionary organization to commit crimes against the state, and they were accused as founders. They needed members of and, the conspiracy, uh, of the conspiracy, and they found those who were already in the list to be sentenced for a second time. I was on one of, of them, and so after a long. Terrible, terrible somehow investigating process for four months and uh, process in prison of Tirana behind closed doors. They were death sentenced and they were executed. And uh, I was sentenced after 16 years, so altogether it became 21. But, and but then I was released before. And I think, if, if I remember rightly, they were sentenced to death and also stripped of their electoral rights for yes, eternity. This is one of the absurdities, yes. <laughs> oh, which yes, was this is one of the absurdities. A, 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 this was a, a, an entirely Kafkaesque experience that uh, you were <laughs> you were going through. But uh, I mean, I think you know the reason why it's really worth reading this book is to try and to try and understand what it means being a 23-year-old in, in Fatos's case, uh, being mm -hmm. condemned to between three and seven years, and then being told for doing absolutely nothing that he was being sentenced again for uh, another 16 years. I mean, it's absolutely crushing. And uh, it's uh, astonishing that Fatos has uh, you know, developed with such a lively and interesting mind. And I remember after reading the book, I asked him, how did you do this? How did you keep your your mind alive? And then he he brought out. Show, tell me what you brought out a little matchbox, Fatos. <laughs> and inside the matchbox, he had tiny little sculptures. 
Yeah, and the book written in the tiny. The book written in yeah. tiny, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. You know, because you have to keep your mind alive. You have to keep your sanity somehow. What were your strategies there for, for surviving this experience, Fatos? I think uh, when I think now about that, uh, I find two main uh, First, I, first of all, I would like to answer how did you survive with, uh, with another question, but did we really survive? So there is a lot of problems. Yeah. But then, if we survive, so first I, I could say mm, being young, you have energy. So uh, young, being young is very important to fight and to, 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 to resist the, the, the physical torture as well, the mind and so on. And the second, in my view, is the to keep a distance from your suffering, a mental, the, 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 the main brain, the brain, <laughs> the big brain should control the emotions and to keep a distance means to see yourself on the stage as well, not only as, you know, as uh, so this distance uh, uh, helps very much to to, to survive mentally, I could say. So if someone is torturing you, there is a way to suffer the torture and to get crazy. But there is a way to, to survive when you, you think, what's happening with me? What's happening with this, this policeman, this terrible, what's the hell is, is this? And if you try to understand, you keep some, you have some, some instruments more to survive, I, I could say. And then the idea to write this experience was very important somehow. In that, of course, there was, I mean, there's one overwhelming figure in Albania and Albanian history after the Second World War, and that is Enver Hoxha. Mm. Um, did you develop in prison a sort of relationship? Because, of course, the conspiracy is, is, comes out of a letter that is a yeah. direct critique of Enver Hoxha, which was a very rare thing for anyone to articulate. Did you obsess about Enver Hoxha? when you were in prison. Did you have a sort of mental relationship with him? Of course, <laughs> every day. And, and what I remember, what I remember is uh, uh, how we were expecting his death. We are living expecting his death as well, in a way, like Stalin's death, because, and uh, what I remember, which I make humor, was that then there were some rumors that Denver Roja is ill and he's going to die. And they were, we were watching television to see. And it was the 1st of May, one of the last 1st of May of Enveroja, maybe 84. And, we, and there were some rumors saying that he is not appearing to this 1st of May, because every 1st of May he was there, you know, crowd, and he was applauded, and so. And, and this 1st of May, this, we said, he is not coming. And we were going to see the, television the celebration and then we saw him <laughs> but he was in a chair for the first time and uh, and 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 but you know I have to say you, know, you must maybe have good. wanted to jump so, up and down of course it was a big delusion for us that he was there but still a friend of mine with a sense of humor we have a saying in Albania when you want to put down someone and so we s somehow we made him so <laughs> just uh, uh, saying sitting. So, yes. but I cannot translate into Albanian into, into English. English. So the meaning is that so, a William Booth we say so. Very sorry, hard centuries of Albanian speakers. Here. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe John can translate it. <laughs> John is <laughs> translate. Oh, is John here? Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, John Hodgson who translated the work is. Uh, the master yeah, of, a bit of a to do on this <laughs> the master of Albania. <laughs> he, he lowered down on his palm. Right. <laughs> so and uh, but of course, so what happened uh, uh, when Hodja died? I mean, you know, I presume when Hodja died, one of your impulses must have been, oh my God, we'll be out tomorrow. We'll be able to leave tomorrow. Because he died in 85, and really it was still another sort of four or five years that you were inside. Yeah, yeah. Uh, first, first, the first thing I remember was that his death was a, was a big trauma for them. And, and, and uh, so this is a- For the party. For the party, and we felt it uh, inside, it was a terror. 
inside prison. Mm -hmm. So you couldn't even, I remember his funeral, we were all sat down and, and we were looking, but we couldn't even smile to each other to express our joy. <laughs> this is you know, really, I have written a, a sore story about that. And uh, this is uh, my first uh, memory of, of his death. So it was the fear to express the joy. Of, uh, and some people were arrested, and, and it was the idea that they will maybe make a terror. <coughs> so they will kill someone now to adjust the down. Then, you know, there were some hopes, but uh, very, very, we soon, very soon understood that the, uh, it was a continuity somehow. It was a continuity, not that hard, but uh, Ramiz Aliel, his successor, very, very, very quickly made a big, a big event, and he started to give names to the to the association of, of the pioneers will, will be called the pioneers of Enver Hoxha. The University of Tirana will be named the University of Enver Hoxha. The, the harbor of Duras will be called, named the harbor Enver Hoxha. So many, many, many names of Enver Hoxha. And then we will build the monument of Enver Hoxha in the main square, so close to Skanderbeg. So it was, all this decision made it clear, and they were, it was very important for Hoxha for them to maintain his, uh, the power. So it was, a, it was the myth of him who remained. And well, mercifully, it didn't. Uh, well, I mean, it lasted for too long, as far as you were concerned. Mm -hmm. But it didn't last. Uh, I mean, it had an end. That was the that was the great thing. And although, well, <clears throat> this is a good moment actually to to move over to to Susan because what happened after the end of communism, of course, was uh, very complicated everywhere, including in Albania. Uh, but also, of course, in Russia, and that's with that I'm going to turn to to Susan um, uh, in a rather inelegant segue. Uh, Susan mm -hmm. Richards, who has worked in uh, so many different capacities that I can't begin to list them all, um, but uh, she's been a film producer. She wrote her PhD on Solzhenitsyn, um, co-founder of Open Democracy, who, which I hope. Uh, uh, many of you know, but also um, a, a writer and with her first book, which was many, many years ago. I mean, when you read this book, Lost and Found in Russia, where's that? I've put up Fatos's book. I want you all to go and buy all the books uh, when we finish this. Lost and Found in Russia. Um, it's taken a long time to write this, but when you read it, you'll understand why it's taken uh, so much time. Uh, because her first book, Epics of Everyday Life, was really situated in the last years of uh, the, the, the Soviet Union. And of course, it, it was at a time when we were all incredibly excited about the potential of, of Russia and the former Soviet Union, the potential for a, for a democratic renaissance there. And lost and found, there's a little bit of the sense of that excitement at the very beginning uh, of the democratic renaissance, but it isn't too long in Lost and Found before we realize what the reality of um, post-communist Russia and indeed Uzbekistan is going to be, uh, is going to be uh, like. And <clears throat> but what's remarkable about the way that um, Susan describes the sort of collapse of hope, if indeed hope ever existed in Russia from 1990 to 1992 and then uh, on through the, the, the 90s, is, is that she is not focusing on the areas that we tend to know very well, which are Moscow and St. Petersburg and one or two, one or two other places. She looks at the uh, most out of the way places imaginable in uh, Russia. The first of which, and it's the sort of center of where her story starts, uh, is a town that is delightfully called Marx. Um, and uh, um, I want to start, Susan, by asking you about the journey which opens your book, and in, a, in, in some senses is a symbolic of what's happening, of the journey to Marx, the trip that you take um, down the Volga to, to get there, uh, because 
tell us about that trip and about the person who you met there who almost put you under in, in hypnotic spell. Um, and in a way, he sort of sets up lots of the other experiences you have later on in the book. Well, um, I, I tried to make it a principle um, when I was traveling in Russia that I would, I would stay with people because um, it's the only perspective from which you can learn anything in my experience of, of, of Russia. And um, when it came to trying to find connections in Moscow to the part of Russia that I was going to, which was the city of Saratov and nearby Marx, I simply drew blanks again and again and again. I simply couldn't, couldn't get the contacts. And um, it was only later that I realized it was because Saratov had been a closed town, and so had Marx. And um, so nobody in Moscow had any contacts there. And um, so in desperation, I finally found that there was a, a, a steamer, a, um, well, no, I, it was a yacht. I thought it was a yacht that was going, someone was taking a yacht down to, to Saratov, and, I, and asked me, um, said I could come with them and introduce me to people. This seemed like a godsend. Um, then uh, I was waiting there on the side of the Volga, waiting for this, what I imagined was going to be a sort of small kind of pleasure cruiser. And only um, in the nick of time, just before it left, did I realize that this great big white river cruiser, the steamer in front of me, was the, the, the boat I was waiting for which of course filled me with dread because the only kind of person who could have hired a boat like that in 1992 was a member of the Mafia. Uh, and still, I didn't have any other way to get to Saratov. And uh, so I, um, I went on board and realized very rapidly that I had made the most terrible mistake because there I was invited to the captain's table, the top table, and the the faces around that table told me that I really had fallen in with the Mafia. They were um, what they, I mean, strashny morty, um, they, they would say in Russian. I mean, they were just, they came straight out of years of camp with scars and terrible teeth and <laughs> tattoos. Anyway. Um, I have to say at this point, Susan, I, I detected that fear when, when you were writing about this in the book. For me, it's journalistic gold, this. You know, this is, <laughs> this is where I want to be. I want to be at the top table with the mafia. <laughs> well, this is where I'm not really a journalist. <laughs> anyway, I was busy losing my appetite in, um, uh, in front of in this array of people when um, a guy comes and sits opposite me, um, even more repulsive than the other ones, <laughs> with a long, straggling beard and weird yellow eyes. And, um, and uh, something funny starts to happen. Um, I'm not usually a very suggestible person. I'm extremely pragmatic. But uh, there was something about those guys' eyes I simply couldn't um, I couldn't get away from them. And he, uh, he fixed me like a sort of uh, an animal and with gaze. And I, I literally couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't get away. I felt as if I was being drawn into his world in a way which I'd never <coughs> experienced anything like it. And it was very, very frightening. It was like standing on the edge of a cliff. And I suddenly, from a social occasion, I suddenly realized that this was, it felt like life and death. I mean, it felt like, um, it sounds as if I'm exaggerating, but it, it felt very, very serious. And uh, I just managed to pull back and left the table, bolted for my room with him in hot pursuit. <laughs> and um, then um, locked myself in my room for quite a long time. Then I thought, oh, goodness, I mean, this is really wet. I've just got to get out of here. Went down to the, to the, to the deck. And there he was again, pursuing me yet again. Oh, my dear, I thought, this is my host. This really is my host, who I'd seen in a distant shot in the back of a, of, of a film. And so I rushed to the, um, to the, uh, the, uh, uh, steward of the, uh, the steward of, of, of the whole um, cruise had a, uh, an, an office. And I, I went there and um, knocked and was let in, only to discover that they fell about laughing when I said, well, you know, I'm sorry, I'm trying to get away from my host, you know. Uh, uh, th 
fifth, because it wasn't my host at all. And um, it was some creep who was a personal extra sensor or healer of my host who wasn't on board. And, um, and they said, you know, this is very weird because usually Westerners don't realize when these really sinister characters are around. But um, you, you were clearly, you know, half Russian. And um, <laughs> anyway, it was a very, um, it was a horrible beginning to the, to the trip and um, left me thoroughly off balance and was the precursor to some always weirder experiencing in the course of my travels. But I think this is the point, that it, uh, this, this, these moments of you know, huge societal transformation and transition, uh, and really 1989 is, it's a once every two centuries or, or so or the transformation or more. Is I mean I was doing the same thing. I was going to weird places all over the former Soviet Union in Eastern Europe, and you simply didn't know what to expect from one village to the next, from one town to the next. You would have entirely sort of autarkic experiences. I what was going on in Marx bore no relationship to what was going on uh, in Moscow, and uh, so you were going from one bizarre, surreal situation to another. And early on, you go to this um, this place, Zarafshan in Uzbekistan. Now, I've done a bit of, you know, traveling around the stands and, and the Caucasus, and you have to be very, very careful. These are extremely strange places. What was it about Zarafshan that, because in a way, Zarafshan really gets you into the deep weirdness, as it were. Um, why in God's name did you go there in the first place? Oh, for mm -hmm. reasons that have rapidly become irrelevant, uh, because <laughs> I had planned a perfectly reasonable, conventional, pragmatic book, which was to be about the transition from communism as seen through a particular country and town mm -hmm. called Marx. And of course, the country was unraveling in front of me. People were going through a collective nervous breakdown. Mm -hmm. the, the, what was meant to have been happening in Marx was not happening. Everything had gone into reverse. And, but I went to Zarafshan because I was pursuing an idea which had collapsed, uh, which later collapsed. Mm -hmm. And um, so when I got there, they burst out laughing. Uh, about my reason for coming, because um, I'd come to track down some Russian Germans who were moving to the Volga, and they, they simply couldn't credit me with having made this, well, which effectively difficult journey, because effectively I had gone to a closed town on an illegal passport. And so I, I was like a sort of um, peacock that lands in the Arctic. I mean, I was a very weird person there, and I had to go into hiding not to be um, captured by the KGB and arrested. And um, in the course of being in hiding, they all started telling me what had, why they imagined I had come, which was because of the epidemic of paranormal visitations which had broken <laughs> out in the town. Um, and I'm not just talking about a few weird hairy devils and shining beings. I mean, hundreds of people at a time were seeing UFOs coming down and hovering over the great gold mine machine, which, which, which um, separates the ore from the rock. I mean, hundreds of skilled workers, high party workers, um, engineers, nuclear physicists. These were you know, not you know, marginal people. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. uh, it, it was all very mystifying. And I discovered later on that that, that this epidemic had spread actually to the upper echelons of the party in Moscow, that um, they had heard all about this, and indeed on one occasion had sent an armed um, helicopter full of troops to, uh, to the town to see off an invasion of refugees from Orion. <laughs> so yes. So this is a sort of this is a collective hysteria. Now, what interested me about uh, about this? I mean, this is you know collective hysteria on a grand scale. The, what I was fascinated about was the fact that somebody in central command, whoever it was, sent the helicopter. 
I, you know, there were people who were living the high life in Moscow who were also buying into this whole thing and thought it perfectly credible that, uh, you know, there, were, there was an invasion being planned from... And the bit of paper was signed by Gorbachev and the head of the armed forces who, um, whose shaking hand was seen on when, uh, that coup, coup attempt um, when Gorbachev was, you know, was uh. put under house arrest. So these were real people as yeah. they went right up to the top. Now, to what extent, let me be slightly provocative here, <laughs> Susan. Um, you, later on you have an experience with a uh, hypomagnetic chamber. I've re written this down. So you should call it a fur-lined sleeping bag in a huge metal <laughs> cylinder. And this tra triggered in you some astonishing out-of-body experiences. Now, can you sort of step back in the way that Fatos had to step back uh, um, uh, uh, during his prison experience and say, actually, I was beginning to be infected by this collective hysteria as well? Or did you, or can you really say, Yes, there were strange things coming out of my head when I went into the hypermagnetic chamber. Well, um, I, I'm afraid you may fail to provoke me because um, <laughs> because one of the um, one of the, 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 the I wrestled enormously long and hard with the very business of trying to write about this stuff at all because this was not my terrain. I, I heartily wished that I hadn't bumped into the paranormal in the, so, in the ex-Soviet <coughs> Union because I, I couldn't write about it. Um, I, I, was, I found that when I tried to write about it, um, I did distance myself and the effect was that the people I wrote about, who I had great respect for, uh, turned out as, as um, little sort of foreign weirdos um, who, you know, it was, it was the usual kind of um, patronizing writing that, um, that the conventional patronizing writing about foreigners. And so again and again, I would try and write these stories in, in such a, I, I, I was trying to dig for some way of understanding why they were seeing what they were seeing, which would leave their dignity intact which was, in fact, why I ended up in this hypermagnetic chamber. <laughs> so all I can, um, I, I was trying to follow up a, a, a very Russian tradition of science, which, which I did have clues as to why they were seeing all this stuff and why I wasn't. Um, anyway, the, the conclusion that I reached at the end of a, what was a very long journey, as a generation of a journey, was that um, there are just some things that I don't understand. You don't have to ever understand everything. And um, I, it's like a, a talkative parrot. Um, you can just put the black cloth over it and say, I don't understand it, but that's fine. So um, I've failed to be provoked. <laughs> so in that case, tell us. You've been going backwards and forwards um, for many years. Mm -hmm. um, tell us what. Uh, how profound and in what way have we misunderstood the Russian experience of the last 20 years? Well, I think that um, for a start, both we and um, the present regime have... By which, I mean, by which I mean Western Europe and the United States, yeah. I suppose. I think we, we, we misunderstood um, the experience of the 90s um, badly in that I, I think that it was a... Um, it was a profoundly creative, um, it was a terrible time, a ter time of terrible trauma, but that if it had been allowed to play itself out, uh, the people who came through that would have come through, were coming through, as um, people um, who really knew what was what and knew how to handle themselves, knew, as they hadn't known at the beginning of the, of the 90s, how to take initiative uh, take responsibility, how to build a new Russia. And um, so this very, very exciting, and how to think for themselves, which, which they couldn't do in 1992. And um, you know, by the end of the 90s, uh, it, 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 was, it was all just, the, the, there was the possibility of a beginning. Uh, and, um, and that was what was cut off brutally by Putin's rise to power, and none of us realized quite how sinister that was going to be immediately. But um, 
How, how much responsibility would you put on Putin and how much responsibility would you put on the oligarch regime? Well, actually, Putin is only the representative of a whole cadre, a whole caste of um, which, uh, I mean, he was picked um, as, as um, and put in place uh, by, uh, by the oligarchs and, um, and by the KGB FSB um, as somebody who was a safe pair of hands, but a pygmy with a safe pair of hands. He turned out you know, to be less of a pygmy than they hoped, but... Um, but uh, but in a way, I mean, the reason why I ask it is because what you describe, particularly in the 1990s, is people who have been completely and utterly betrayed by uh, the brave new world of the brave new world of of, uh, of capitalism, as you know, set out in the early 1990s by. Gaidar, Chubais, and the oligarchs, and so and on. And by the Western advisors. And by too. the Western advisors. This, advisors. I think, is common ground that I have with, um, uh, with, with, with the brothers, which is our, 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 our common um, uh, hatred of Jeffrey Sachs and, um, and um, every, everything that he and his Harvard clan visited on those poor, inexperienced <laughs> Russian economists. Trusting, yeah. Trusting, yeah. Well, it was a very, very um, uh, traumatic experience, but uh, as I say, extremely well described, but from a different perspective, not, uh, not usually read. Um, the perspective uh, less well read. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, but uh, Susan has done the link for me. <laughs> <laughs> Jeffrey Sachs, if you're watching, I'm just the chairman. <laughs> Um, so, uh, um, to the Puritan gift. Now, this is really astonishing because, in a sense, uh, it is a much simpler book than the first two because it is a, a narrative with a beginning uh, and an end. But it, it's, it's, it's very difficult to, to try and describe the uh, complexity clarity in the book, but it is a complex uh, argument that is really pretty monumental. Um, and so uh, it's time to come on to uh, uh, Kenneth, who's at the end there, and William Hopper, two brothers uh, who have uh, must have worked a very long time on this in, w in one way or, or another. This is really an explanation, as far as I understand it, uh, of why American capitalism uh, became the most effective uh, and um, uh, effective form of capitalism in the world, the dominant form of capitalism in the 20th century. If the 20th century was the American capitalism, this essentially gives you the answer as to why that was so. It also uh, interestingly explains uh, why it is now failing. Um, uh, and it, I hope in the discussion it will become clear what the essence of that success and, and failure is. Um, now, I'm not sure who to address each question to, um, but they can sort it out amongst themselves. I'm going to start by going right to the beginning of this uh, book, which is in the middle of the 17th uh, century. and. Uh, I want one of you to explain to us the significance, uh, as detailed in your book, of the Massachusetts Bay Company and of Puritanism. Uh, so, whoever. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> um, I hadn't expected to start with this particular part of the part of the book, but um, let's start at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the beginning was a long way before that. But uh, the, 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 since you asked, I, I will start with this. I, I uh, spent a, a working career working in American companies and in British companies. And uh, my first move really was to Procter & Gamble from British companies, and it was just a um, difference between fire and ice. The, um, 
simplicity of the management of Procter and Gamble compared with the complexity of, uh, of the British companies. I tell people that even if you've never been inside a British factory, you know how it was run if you have seen upstairs, downstairs. It's, uh, the, the, you, you remember the, the complexity of that place. It's, it's not that the people were stupid by any means, but just the, all the different little empires and so on that had to be met. And in a British company, you could find hundreds of unions, everyone with their own aim. And also, there was a very, uh, there was a great heritage of the class tradition um, that um, uh, people who worked in factories didn't even go to high school. They left school at 14. Um, they didn't get very much education beyond that. If they did get a higher national, a lower national, or a higher, that was a very good qualification. You then left the factory and went into design. It, it, it's, it's a very complex setup. I, mean, I moved to Procter and Gamble, and just things were quite simple. And it, it, one thing that uh, this is to tie into the uh, the Puritan migration that uh, I noticed a very big difference, and that was that before Americans made their decisions, and here I'm talking of factories, they got down to a lot of detail. They worked out, they looked at the different alternatives. Uh, the, it, it was a very democratic society insofar as, the, as I say, there was no class structure in the organization. They would uh, get down to a lot of details, and after they got all the detail, they would pull it together and they would make the decision and they then found that all the work they had done in preparing for the decision became an immediately already done plan for action. So this is my little lead into the, 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 what I found. And I, um, uh, some of you may know, I went to Harvard for a year and uh, was asked to leave. Um, uh, and uh, I was able to take up, I moved to New York and became very interested indeed in American history. And one of the uh, first books that I came across uh, was uh, a, a book on the Puritan migration. And uh, this was by Samuel Eliot Morrison, a very wonderful historian. And he told the, contrasted the uh, great failure of, first of all, the uh, um, Virginia migration, which we will not bother about, uh, but of the pilgrims, which everyone in America takes such pride in, they really were a disaster. They, and uh, coming forward to the rest of our book, one of the things they did not have was domain knowledge. They were going to transport themselves to, uh, across the Atlantic, and they knew nothing about shipping. They knew very little about uh, organizing a community. Um, so they, they liked that, but uh, they um, sort of took the easy path. They moved down from East Anglia to the Thames, they climbed on a ship, the Mayflower. They, uh, so they sailed down the Thames. Uh, naturally, they had to sort of wait at the far end till the wind changed, turned round. By the time they got, then they met up with the, the Speedwell that came from Holland. The Speedwell, uh, by the time it got, they met together in Southampton was sinking. They had to spend a lot of their money on repairing it. They set out, they pulled back into was it Portsmouth. They certainly had two stops on the way, which, uh, and eventually they all set out on one ship. And by the time they had set out, it was September. They did not arrive in New England till, uh, till Christmas Day, which is not a nice time to arrive in New England with no houses, no place to stay. They, most, uh, half of the people had to stay on the ship till March. By March, uh, half of them were dead. Now contrast this with the, the, the Puritans, who were also business people, hard-headed, and they also knew technology. Um, they, um, Samuel Eliot Morrison commented how remarkable it was that in those days when there was no post, a, not very good communications indeed of any kind, uh, the, the decision was made in East Anglia to sail to New England, and only five months later, they had all assembled in Southampton, from the north of England, from the west of England. They had found their way down there on the dreadful roads of that time, and uh, they were able to sit there, uh, clean ships, waiting for the right wind, 
When the wind turned to the right direction, they climbed on the ships and they sailed straight across the Atlantic. They arrived, when was it, in, in, in July? In July, yes. In July, and they had already sent a, a pilot project ahead into, New, um, into Old Salem, and the, the, the pilot projects had been there for a year or so. They were able to welcome them with excellent, excellent dinners and houses to live in. So Samuel Elliott Morrison asked the question, how did they manage to do this? And the answer that he came up was the exact same one that I had noticed, that in their preparation, they had got down to a lot of detail. Uh, so that the actor, I mean, people would have been asked, if we go, will you come with us? And they would have thought through the process of what to do with their house and what to bring with them. So when the actual decision was made to go, they were all able to get on their horses or whatever it was and set out for Southampton. Anyway, they, that, that's really perhaps as much as I want to say about well, the... So this, this becomes this, you know, the, the domain knowledge, as, as you call it, yes. um, this... Uh, uh, this, you know, mode of management becomes the decisive mode of management, if I understand it correctly, in the United States, or evolves. Yes. Can I just say? Such. So I just say one thing: the Pilgrims were under 100 people in one ship. The Puritans were 16,000 people in 100 ships, and that's over 10 years. And they founded, they were the Massachusetts Bay Company, they founded the colony of Massachusetts, which thrives, has thr thriven, is that the past tense? Thriven. Thriven <laughs> to this day. <laughs> and uh, of those hundred ships, only one was lost at sea, which, considering we're in the 1630s, was utterly remarkable. I mean, this was an event like V Day, even like the Moonshot, you know, as they could. Sorry. Yeah, no, actually, now, in terms of, but this is fine because we have to, given the constraints of time, we have to rush through the centuries um, <laughs> and uh, uh, move up three centuries very, very quickly um, to the 20th century. But uh, 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 the um, ability of American capitalism to assert itself in world markets starts to become clear at the end of the at the end of the 19th century, um, beginning of the 20th century, and obviously with the with the First World War. There then we then see, according to you, this extraordinary period of 1920 to 90, the 1920s to the 1970s. Uh, where you refer to the, uh, you know, sort of epoch-defining companies of the time collectively as the great, uh, the and, great and engine. No. Um, was this, as you understand it, an unambiguously positive um, episode in the history of, of uh, American industry uh, with reference to the rest of the world as well? Oh, and, and, uh, I would say on balance it was, certainly was and it was of great benefit to the world. It's, uh, this is uh, the ability to uh, America still hasn't solved its problem of distribution, certainly hasn't solved its health problem. But uh, these uh, great companies, uh, I mean, I remember in Glasgow the word going round that, uh, that there were no need for slums, that, they, that there were these great companies that could produce enough goods uh, that people would need, um, but as I say, that still left out the distribution. So, uh, you know, what was it that gave the great engine, the companies of the great engine, this uh, competitive advantage uh, over, uh, you know, other, other companies which had global aspirations from uh, Europe in particular at the time? And what was it that linked? The, the Puritan ethic, the Puritan gift, as you call it, yeah. uh, to them and the way that they, the way that they operated. Well, it, uh, I had started with the uh, getting into the Puritan migration, and uh, uh, there was a great thing in New York in those days, and that was the second-hand bookshops. And for sort of ten cents, you could get all the masterpieces. 
and I was able to sort of go one stage at a time. And having uh, uh, sorted out the Puritans to myself, uh, I started to look at the next stages and talk to Americans. And they introduced me to people like the Shakers, uh, the Mormon migration, which again was uh, virtually a, a, a duplication of, of the Puritan migration. So all of this was success breeding success and the traditions and practices coming down from one level to another. What was it, uh, well, what was, it, what was in this model that was so successful? What was it about the Puritans or the Mormons or whatever which gave them a competitive advantage that facilitated the emergence of the great engine? I think that's what I'm trying to get well, at. Yeah. Um, well, uh, um, Essentially, Puritanism was a religion that was de developed as the new technologies were emerging, as technology was emerging. And it obviously was a, a religion of a society that, that quite simply could handle technology. Uh, important features in it, one was, uh, Tawney wrote about the lack of class structure in, in Puritanism. And uh, I was just sort of almost stunned going through level by level up to the 20th century how it was the same answer, the, the respect for technology, the respect for education, um, um, that, that, that was giving them one level of success after another. Um, and so it led on through, and I hope I'll have a little bit of time to talk about the occupation of Japan. But well, you uh, can. We'll go straight on to that now. I mean, what you argue, again, as I understand it, uh, is, is that uh, after the end of the Second World War and with the American occupation of Japan that these practices which had been so successful in the United States were transmitted to Japan at its year zero, as it yeah, were, yeah. Uh, and that the Japanese were extremely receptive to this. They were indeed, yes. Do, do tell us about how that happened. Well, <clears throat> in the, um, MacArthur landed at, at Sugi airport with only a handful of troops on August the 30th, 1945. Churchill called it the bravest deed of the war. There were 22 Japanese divisions next door to him with some 300,000 trained Japanese troops who had never shown much friendship towards Americans. Uh, MacArthur, I've written here, wanted to convey the message that the Americans came in peace and he did not even carry a sidearm when he landed in, the, in this uh, airport. He waved his corn cob pipe at them. Now, a, a critical matter here is that uh, Japan, MacArthur was under a secret order not to do anything to help the Japanese economy. That was the Japanese, that was their problem. We didn't like the Japanese in those days. And there was a gentleman, Henry Morgenthau, who had proposed a plan that would reduce G Germany and Japan to pastoral economies for, I think, 20 generations. <laughs> uh, this was, uh, some people th decided that was not a wise idea, but the secret order still forbade them to take any concern about, uh, about the Japanese economy. There's a very famous story that he wasn't supposed to worry about them being fed either, and he sent his very famous telegram to Washington Send me gun, send me food, or send me guns, and they, they sent him food. But uh, they, 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 there was one uh, technology that had to be uh, restored, and that was the Japanese communication system. And, uh, and uh, MacArthur had a little idea that it would be a nice thing, it'd be good if Japanese families could have their own little radio sets. They hadn't been allowed to have them under the dictatorship. And uh, this word was put to Washington. And Washington said, it's a very nice idea, but if the Japanese need a little radio sets, you'll have to show them how to make them. And one of the heroes of our story was Homer Saris, a communication engineer, and he was given the job of showing the Japanese how to make radio sets. And the, the book tells quite a bit of the detail of that. Now, the story now moves forward until the winter of 48, 49. And this is when the, um, uh, the communists had taken over Eastern Europe. And it was also the, the winter when uh, the, the communists marched into Peking. And Washington suddenly realized that it would be a good thing if the Japanese economy got going. And the word was sent to MacArthur, for heaven's sake, get the, get the economy going. 
<laughs> and a special ambassador was enlisted, uh, that was Joseph Dodge, and he was sent out to, you know, work with them and make sure everything went in that direction. And Homer Saracen told me that, um, that the word went down, the, uh, rang down the dark corridors of MacArthur's headquarters, that there'd been this change in policy, and he and his two colleagues um, they, they realized that the knowledge they had and the background they had, they could get this communications manufacturers onto a new level of effectiveness. And they re reported this to their military boss, who must have taken that with MacArthur, and Saracen was invited to make a presentation uh, in the large space in front of MacArthur's office on the sixth floor of the Daiichi building. And Saracen loved to tell the story of how he was opposed by the very large economic section, ESS, um, Economic and Science section, and they argued that they shouldn't teach the Japanese this, that they were giving away too many of their secrets. And then it was, it was Saracen's turn to talk and uh, he, he, as I say, he liked to tell the story that he went through his presentation. MacArthur sat puff, puffing his pipe, no, said nothing, got up, walked to the door, still said nothing, and Saracen thought to himself, I've blown it. And MacArthur turned and pointed his pipe at him and said, go do it. And so so he went and he went and did it and you saw the communication of the American model into Japan and then after that into the into yeah. the Far East yes. but I, ironically this is a, just at the very beginning, although it really sort of matures 20 years or so later on, yeah. that I want a, a process that I want to talk to uh, William about before I throw everything it, it, over to the audience. Could I just add one phrase to my bit? Yes. It, it is just that you have to know the three people and their <coughs> background experience and their ability to understand how they had so much of this uh, domain knowledge and experience that they were, had to pass on. These were not if you can be saying it's somebody who'd studied economics in college and went out to advise, these were people that really knew that. Who had worked to... Uh, uh, and, and that is what they passed on. Right, right. Okay. So, uh, 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 William, um, so, <laughs> so America has provided this model which is uh, incredibly, has been incredibly effective in the United States and is now spreading in <laughs> the Far East. And then... <clears throat> 1970s, 1980s, uh, it decides, or uh, this is discarded, and we get a new model. We get the model of uh, financial capitalism, uh, which uh, has very little regard, as far as we can see, for domain knowledge or knowledge of any sort. Why is it that uh, America, at the height of its success around the world, is unable to maintain this strategy. Please enlighten us very on good. this. Um, Thank very you very much. Just to round off the last little bit, I just point out that the managerial revolution, which Kenneth has been talking about, led to the Japanese economic miracle. The Japanese then taught the other Asian nations. The Koreans and, and so on. And particularly the Taiwanese, and now the Taiwanese run a very large part of the economy of mainland China. China. Uh, but still, we now leap forward. Mm. <laughs> I'm now going to talk about the financial bubble, if I may. The, um, now, to start with just a little introduction, you know, Western capitalism has been characterized by a sequence of bubbles since 1630. Uh, the most famous of them is, I'm sure everybody knows about, the great Dutch tulip bubble about this, of the 1620s. Uh, at the peak of this, it's also known as the tulip mania, and at the peak of this mania in February 1637, one single bulb sold for 40 times the wages of one, the annual wages of one skilled person. Uh, the bubble broke several weeks later and uh, resulted in a great deal of unemployment, etc., etc. Now, I'm going to leap right forward to the bubble in which we are, and it is, I probably, uh, I think, undoubtedly the biggest finan <laughs> financial bubble of all time. I mean, all financial bubbles have 
the, something in common and all have their characteristics, the special characteristics. Uh, they, what they have in common is, of course, massive abuse of debt, um, which is known as debt leverage, and wild speculation. Um, and that has indeed characterized, I mean, you see the United States in debt to, and, the, and the United Kingdom in debt to an extent that hasn't been seen from the, since the Second World War, when there were somewhat different rules applied. Um, the particular characteristic of this bubble, I think, is the collapse in the, what we can call the managerial culture of the United States. Now, this is what Kenneth has been talking about. It's what started off with the Massachusetts Bay Company. It rose to a peak of excellence in the 16, uh, sorry, the 1950s and 60s. It's what the Americans taught the Japanese. And this is very fortunate because it was the United States government that taught the Japanese. So it's all recorded in the National Archives in Washington. And if you want to know how the American domestic economy was run in the 1950s and 60s, the best way to find out is to study what the Americans taught the Japanese, because they explicitly taught which was a, what was a largely implicit culture. But tell us, I must move you on, William, because exactly. of the time, the time process. Why has it failed now? Well, the, um, a new concept of management arose in the United States. Uh, it can be attributed ultimately a book to a book called the um, uh, what it, uh, Frederick Taylor's The Principles of Scientific Management, which was published in 1911. But I mean, it developed a great deal after that. Uh, it has been referred to as professional management, and we always put that in quotes. Uh, and professional management, the concept of professional management was that it, management was uh, a profession like medicine or dentistry of the law. And instead of learning on the job, you went to a postgraduate school, you acquired a qualification. Uh, and having acquired that qualification, you did not require, um, you did not learn <coughs> what we call the craft of management. I'll, I'll be very brief. If you go back to, say, 1950, a young man would, and there were very few women in business at that time, a young man would go from um, college where he'd taken one degree, and he'd go into a manufacturing company, and he would learn what we call the craft of management. That's something you learn on the job. There's a certain amount of theory, but not very much. You learn the craft of management. And as you move up the ladder of promotion, you acquire, and I'm now going to use a phrase that was launched by one of the heroes of our book, Jeff Immelt, the chairman and chief executive today of General Electric, which is the biggest manufacturing company in the world. Uh, you acquired domain knowledge. Now, domain knowledge is actually a very simple concept. Domain knowledge that means that banks should be run by people who understand banking. Engineering companies should be run by people who understand engineering. Wars should be fought by people who understand wars. Um, and it's, it's quite extraordinary that the chief executive of the biggest manufacturing company in the world has to make a statement of this kind, that people ought to have domain knowledge. But this was the impact of the growth of the concept of professional management. You didn't need domain knowledge because you had acquired the skills of management in an academic setting. And you didn't need domain knowledge, and you didn't need to acquire the craft of the management. Now, um, the, the, I'd just like very quickly, to, if I may, to quote um, Dr. Peter Drucker, uh, probably the best management writer on management ever, way back in the, I happened to work with him in New York in the 1950s, which shows you how old I am. And he wrote a, a, a great book called The Practice of Management, published in 1954. And I quote, no greater damage could be done to our economy or to our society than to attempt to professionalize management by licensing managers, for example, or by limiting access to management to people with a special academic degree. Now, Peter's uh, warning was totally disregarded. And by the end of the 20th century, over 50% 
of chief executives of American companies who are professional managers. And I'm sorry to tell you that in January 2001, a professional manager with a Harvard business <laughs> degree entered the Oval Office of the White House. But what you're, what you're so. saying there, William, is before I, before I hand over, uh, over to the audience, what you're saying there is, is that this bubble is not just another bubble. It is also a strategic defeat for the United States in terms of the way that it runs its economy with regard to the rest of the world. It is indeed. I mean, I listened to the um, governor of the Bank of England two weeks ago saying that this is a crisis in the financial sector. This is untrue. The crisis started in the manufacturing sector. It actually started in uh, General Motors and the rather famous event in 1956 and spread slowly throughout the whole of society. So it is a crisis of the whole of society. I mean, just compare the, um, the uh, occupation of Japan with the occupation of Iraq. As Kenneth has told you, there was secret director of 1390, I think, <laughs> enormously long, detailed. I mean, just give you an example. One of the clauses said, you are to pursue policy, social policies that promote the even distribution of wealth. Now, that is a shattering statement. I mean, it is said that the New Deal had a bigger impact through MacArthur on Japan than it ever had on the United States. But then the point, that's not the point I'm making. The point is when, when MacArthur landed at Atsugi Airport, he had a 30-page plan of what he was to do. Uh, as you all know, when uh, Mr. Bush and Mr. Blair defeated the Iraqi army, they had no plan. <laughs> of what to do next. Yeah, uh, Stop. That is the collapse of domain knowledge uh, and the craft of management in the public sector in the military. Well, uh, <laughs> sobering thought indeed. Um, thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, I'd like to remind you again, back up that applause with purchases of their book. <laughs> <laughs> really understand what they're saying. Let me uh, throw it over to the floor now and uh, ask for any questions. Obviously, with this diverse panel directed uh, relatively specifically. Um, oh, there. Let's talk. Can you hear me? Yep. You're fine. Um, my question is for Fatos. Um, an incredible book, in sort of Albanian darkness at dawn, gutting read, but also a fantastic description of human nature. Well, how do you feel now that there doesn't seem to have been any judicial resolution for these people, no judgment of them, as far as I know? I think the executioners, the judges, especially the witnesses, the capos, your spies, they've all gone without any kind of trial themselves. How do you feel about this? Would it have made any difference to you in your sort of healing process if there is such a thing? Thank you. Yeah. This is just a very big question, just to give you a detail that the prosecutor of who is of, of the two guys, was uh, maybe some months ago, was given a medal, by a, medal. The, a medal from the president of Albania, who is a member of the anti-communist party, Bamir Tofi. For justice, somehow, for for, mer for services, merit, services, to, services justice. to justice, so without distinguishing. And so, how do I feel, and, and how would we do feel? So you can 
personally feel it, and but you can see it even in the general context of, of what's going on in our society. And personally, I feel it like a defeat somehow of and of all what we expected, especially. I feel it as a defeat for those who are dead, because always there have been questions, uh, uh, how shall we deal with the past? There are different formulas, uh, uh, amnesty but not amnesia, or there have been truth and, and justice and reconciliation and all this. But uh, they, are, they have been always linked with the problems actual problems, the, the present problems of the, of the society. But the, the most terrible thing that I feel is for those who couldn't live these days, who died before, and undone justice is, 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 uh, makes all of us guilty. So I have a feeling of guiltness myself for not doing it. And then I have, uh, of course, I analyze what's going on, and in general terms, I see Albanian case uh, uh, more close to Russia, if I can compare it. So um, uh, what is in common is the continuity of 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 the of the regime of the Stalinist regime for a long time, and uh, so when Paul the second was speaking about. Uh, about uh, the difference between communism and, and, and Nazism, is saying that God has his, had his reasons to make it live longer, communism. And uh, so, I, uh, meaning that Nazism was much worse. But anyway, if you think of Holocaust and Second World War, yeah, maybe you can, s and if you, s if you think of communism in Poland, yes, okay. But still, this long, long time of the regime is, is something specific, and it makes you think about what does it mean for generations to live, and with the idea that nothing will change. And, and, and so if you analyze that, there I find two things very important to say. Long term regime under the dictatorship uh, makes people somehow, like I said in, 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 in Edinburgh, I quoted uh, the story of, a, of a unfortunate uh, the book of the Nobel Prize, uh, the Hungarian uh, Nobel uh, Prize, uh, and, uh, Kurtes, and yes. he's sick, speaking about uh, Imre Kurtes, yes. speaking about uh, what does it, why he was had chosen a, a, a child for, for as a, a protagonist, a hero of his book. He says because dictatorships uh, make you ch as like children who mm. try to survive, mm. and survival means collaboration. Mm. And so, and that's why he's saying that he likes much more Benigni's film La Vita e Bella than Life is beautiful. Sh Schindler's uh, List. Schindler's List. And because he finds it kitsch. Because in this, and I understand quite well this collaboration of Berini with, uh, with the Nazis in order to save his child. So I think, so when we try to, to understand why we couldn't make justice, we have to stress this idea of collaboration, so everybody was collaborating with the regime, was feeling guilty, and this common guiltness uh, makes it more difficult. And that, this is the long term, living in long term with the Nazis, okay, but some didn't collaborate, they were there. Well, it's complex, but still you find it was a shorter time and you could have another generation, but when three generations leave, uh, one after the other, let's say. But That's why. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and if, uh, but of course, your example of the, the prosecutor in the second yeah. sentence receiving yeah, a, a medal for services and, to justice you know, after, it's, uh, after we all know what he did. Yeah. And I said, that, but this is what is when I learned That's why it some it, 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 it's able to extend its mm. hand beyond 
Yeah, I sent yeah. a, an SMS to the president. Oh, and did you, what did you say? And said, I, I, uh, let me express my indignation for the, this act. And he called me just at once and said, Fatos, I didn't know. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm so sorry I did, but I didn't know that that he was. Um, but then, <laughs> and the thing I have to say about Albania, everybody knows everything. Everybody, yeah. it's a Not, very small country. You know, but you know what happened, what I learned after that the the secretary is again one of the main uh, personages of the book, the secretary of the of the trial. Yeah. Is his uh, father-in-law mm. the president's father? Yes. So that's Slovenia, so well. as John John has said. So, uh, it's a uh, he. Had, it's a uh, when he tries to explain the the our totalitarianism, he calls it family totalitarianism. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> a clan. Uh, another question was there. Yes, it's, it's a question for the brothers and for Susan. Um, I've done some work with McKinsey and other management consultants, and they're very, very smart people, and lots of them have had experience in other professions before they become management consultants. And the question really is, how can such smart people get things so badly wrong mm -hmm. in Russia? That how did they take what you know the simplest tools of SWOT analysis, you know, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats, and, so on, and then go into a place which seems like an opportunity, and then miss the point? Almost entirely. How, just, how would you explain uh, that? I would. Uh, sorry, shall I? Yes. Uh, Please. I was, I was McKinsey'd. Yeah. That was the verb, to be McKinsey'd. Uh, way, way back in the 1970s, I was a director of some um, London merchant bank called Hill Samuel, and uh, our great chairman uh, called in McKinsey, and they came into my department, and I had three. Uh, young people, very nice young people, one girl, two boys, uh, she was 23, they were 22 each, and they came in to tell me how to run my department, and they hadn't a clue, um, and I paid no attention, and eventually they disappeared, and uh, that was the end of that. It had no impact whatsoever, but the point is they came in without domain knowledge. I was, knew an awful lot about Eurobonds, I'd been in the trade for 10 years, but this idea was emerging at that time that you outsource to the strategic decision making. It was called strategic consulting, but since you paid them a million dollars, you didn't really, uh, you normally took their advice. Um, and uh, I think, you know, I, th I think my answer is that they did lack domain knowledge and they were called in to, uh, at enormous expense to give opinions on very important subjects. And very often what they just did is they listened to their clients and they reflected back what the clients wanted to hear. So I, that, I don't know if you consider that an adequate explanation. Um, can I just give an, a rather different answer, which, which um, sort of bridges both experiences, which is, for instance, when I was set out to write my first book, I was wanting to know how ordinary people could have remained under the spell of this ideology way after it was obvious that it had broken down completely. I mean, what was the disassociation between the myth in their heads, which had remained intact from the Stalinist period, and the broken reality? And very soon, I mean, I, I have then, this was followed by a very sobering experience of finding that I, too, had been caught up in the euphoria of believing that it would be possible to bring democracy. Uh, I mean, it, because I wanted it to be true so badly. By that time, I was tremendously involved with, you know, the, I, 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 wanted, I wanted it to, there, there to be a happy ending. And so just a few years after I'd been asking these penetrating questions, I, along with Jeffrey Sachs and most other people, everybody, we all <laughs> thought that, um, and so the, what I'm really saying is that we were talking about hypnosis earlier, that I don't think there's such a big difference between hypnosis and the thing that we, this kind of, there's this gathering effect that we, w w human beings like to 
um, get carried away by something. We want to be led somewhere, and we, we easily give our authority and um, our hearts to, uh, uh, to um, we, we give up our, our common sense and our domain knowledge in favor of a comforting myth. I think in the case of uh, financial capitalism though, in the 1990s and the early 2000s is this was underwritten by uh, a, a, an elite which was you know accumulating vast sums of money yeah. and so you know it had a, a, a real motive for spreading the news about how wonderful this uh, uh, truly appalling system of, of, of pillage uh, really uh, was, and so it. I, I mean, there was a you know there was a strong driving force there, an active driving force amongst a, a class of, of, of you know financial capitalists uh, to make sure that everyone else believed that this was the way forward, you know, because uh, also in the knowledge that when the whole thing collapsed. That the, the that the state would underwrite everything. So it was, you know, it was it was socialism for Wall Street, basically. Can I just add a comment. If you are the chief executive of a big company, and you lack domain knowledge, which was what has came come to pass, there are two places you can look for it. You can either dip down into middle management because they have to have domain knowledge to do their business, or you can go to a consultant. Now, it's, it's very difficult for the chief executive to ask the middle manager what he ought to be doing. <laughs> so, so you tend to go out to a firm like McKinsey and you, you pay them several million and you get advice and you accept it. And that's, I think, what went wrong. Uh, another question there. I just wanted to ask uh, Susan a question about, about what she thought of the future of Russia. It seems that the country is a strange mixture of anger and, and corruption at the minute. You've got tremendous belligerence, you know, whether it's Georgia and Ukraine externally or internally in, in the North Caucasus. And then you've got this s sort of mafia elite accumulating money and protecting their interests. Um, on the one hand, while investing nothing in the infrastructure, and you've got the demographic challenges, and you've got the fact that you know that, that things like the army, uh, I think 16 people were killed in the first half of this year through hazing um, in the Russian army, and I just wonder what, how you th saw any of those tensions resolving, or if it would just carry on under Putin like that for the next 30 years. Big question, Susan, rather you than me. <laughs> well, I, I, um, increasingly, I actually think that, um, that this uh, regime is, is doomed because I, I think it has become so corrupted that take, for instance, President Medvedev's um, desires to, d desire to have you know, a, a campaign against corruption. Now, that is absolutely impossible because you can't cut off your legs and your arms and your neck I mean, they, they were just, they are all utterly corrupted. And the, you know, the corruption sort of sheds down, right the way downwards. It, and um, it's unpurgeable. And also, um, there is no room in the present regime for the kind of um, sort of, feed, you know, Stafford Beard, like feedback systems. You can't learn from experience. There is, there is nowhere to move forward from here. And so there is going to be, I'm afraid a, 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 a much bigger collapse, a much bigger reckoning. It, it's a it's it's a cul-de-sac, and um, th th there'll be a really nasty reckoning, and then there'll be something more reasonable. I mean, th there's an awful lot of people I mean, when you, when they do the quiet surveys about attitudes, you know, anonymous surveys. What they're getting is um, that people. These are very educated people. A lot of them have been to, to the, been educated in the West. They will leap onto a completely different bandwagon as soon as they can. They just can't put it. And so yes, it's, it, I think it'll come sooner rather than later too. Uh, at the back, it's a question for Libonia. Um, after all these years, how do you feel about uh, Hoja? Have you forgiven him? Forgiven. Hodja. If I have forgiven. <laughs> no, I I, 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 I try to rationalize the thing and to find uh, what was behind, how we created Enver Hoja. 
Yeah. Why? So it's not Enver Hoxha as a person. He is uh, somehow representing a, a culture. And the, we, we, I find the shade of Enver Hoxha still there. And I try to, to, to uh, fight against that shadow, which means that I have not for, forgiven Enver Hoxha. <laughs> <laughs> So no, no forgiveness. <laughs> no, no way. <laughs> yeah, down at the down at the front. Uh, we're going to have two more questions, by the way, and then we'll then we'll wrap up. So um, I've read um, the Puritan Gift, and I'm a very big fan of it, and I'd recommend it to anyone. Uh, and I agree with at least 90 percent of it. But <laughs> I do think there are some things where you can overdo nostalgia for golden ages. I mean, some of the companies like IBM, AT&T, General Motors, which who were very, very strong in the domain knowledge that, 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 that Will and Ken um, rightly lord, they all turned into bureaucratic monstrosities, grossly complacent, blind to the changes that were going on around them. And in some cases, they, those companies have been destroyed. and. Um, um, in one case, in the case of IBM, were rescued by a professional manager who came in, who saw things in a different way, um, Lou Gerstner. Because it is the fate of all those who are particularly strong in a particular domain that they will be marginalized or challenged or eventually, in many cases, uprooted by challengers who see things in a different way. So domain knowledge is not always a panacea. It is no answer for, for the challenges of creative destruction, which are really intrinsic to capitalism. Yeah. I say that's uh, well, a, first of all, a I must challenge. Say thank you, and I, I have to agree with <laughs> everything you say. I mean, Even though I'm a consultant. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, we, um, partly for the purpose of a lecture, you, you, you talk about good management in the 1950s and bad management in the year 2009. Of course, there was an awful lot of bad management in the 1950s, and there is a lot of good management today. So you have to slightly simplify it, but this, I think that the, the narrative is a, a correct one. Um, and uh, I mean, I th well, I've, I've made a particular study of IBM. I'm not a particular fan of Mr. Gessner. I mean, I think uh, that you, for good management to exist, you need A, domain knowledge, but B, you have to learn the craft of management. And I do not think he had learned the craft of management or applied it. Uh, I mean, just look at some of the statistics. I think um, um, I, I, they're, in, they're, they're in the book, but I mean, if you look at the prizes... But what about his, gen his, yeah. his general point that yeah, he's, I agree with him. I mean, he, he, he's making that there's been, you know, a lot fair of deal bad of... management then, and there was a, a severe decline. Uh, but also, there are times we have to bring in someone, uh, kind of an emergency, with, uh, who perhaps doesn't have the kind of dom domain knowledge you would expect. I remember when I was living in New York that um, Con Edison really became overwhelmed with corruption, and somebody was brought in from outside with a, with a very good reputation for, for integrity, and he straightened it out, but he was not an engineer. He'd, uh, uh, so I, I think we both agree with you that. Uh, is by no means So consultants absolute. are not entirely dead. <laughs> <laughs> so we're still employed. We're even still employed. <laughs> I, I, I wasn't going to say that. In his biography, it does say that he's worked well, as a consultant. He's one of the but other, he's one of the other I, I was an industrial consultant. Oh, and I taught things called. Uh, one more question at the back there. Yes. Um, um, I've, I've listened with great pleasure to the debate, and, but, but I just have one comment, which is about that um, it's something that, uh, that you hinted at in particular. And it's a provocative question, which um, is like this. How is, if you want, the mythology and magics of neoliberalism different from the one that you witnessed in terms of the way nowadays under neoliberal economies and ideologies, it is possible for managers or politicians to, I, you know, to think that a, a hospital or a school can be profitable, for example. And the way these ideologies has been destructively implemented in the East uh, or everywhere else, you know, is is a is possibly part of an equally irrational mythology that, uh, in a way, makes us question 
you know, our own superiority. Because now it, it seems like from listening to the debate that, that uh, you know, some things happen over there in Albania and in Russia. Whereas, and now moving to Albania, I mean, uh, the president of the Lloyd's TSB Bank, who has, uh, you know, led the, the bank to bankruptcy, has cashed in a bonus of million pounds. So there goes the accountability and the morality of the public with our own money. So in, in, in what's the difference between the magic there and the unaccountability there from the one that we've missed in, in, in our everyday lives? Well, I'm only the chairman, so I'm not going to give you an answer. <laughs> attempt to synthesize an answer there, but if any of our panelists want to, uh, the floor is yours. Susan, I, I, you're... I'm, I'm, I'm much less than is comfortable, I, I would say. Um, Uh, William, I'm, 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 I'm sorry. To, Kenneth and I are rather old, and one of the things is that don't hear things in our hearing as good as it should be. I, I think, I mean, I we were being asked the characteristic of good management and to distinguish it from bad management. Is that over the period of time and over a large geographic? No, area? no. I think we were uh, thinking more of. Uh, we were uh, talking more about how. Uh, how uh, uh, the the magic and <laughs> the magic and mythology that is used to bamboozle people in order to promote particularly particular ideologies. Uh, I mean, it, yeah. it was such a sort of and uh, and Fatos uh, knows a lot about that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I thought I understood partly what uh, Nicola said. So the fact that in our countries. Communism was somehow, and communist ideology, were replaced by neoliberalist uh, ideology taken as as a myth, as as a as a, as a myth, mm -hmm. and uh, which made, for instance, Albanians call even restaurants Berlusconi. So the new man, the new man of who replaced the new man of, of communism was the Berlusconi style, the, the, the businessman. And uh, uh, without a critical spirit, we took it in our country mm -hmm. and with total trust to, mm -hmm. to, to, to the Western. So the, all, the entire in the West was taken like this. And this, in, in some ways, if you come to Albania, often I say to, to Italians that if you want to see yourself in a mirror, in a ca exactly. caricature way, exactly. you, you find Albania. So <laughs> countries like the Eastern countries are somehow a caricature, a grotesque of, of the Western uh, countries. Somehow. And that's exactly what I tell people about going to Russia. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's a great observation. But I'd like to, uh, I'd like to f finish off with, uh, with um, something that Susan wrote, which struck me, which applies to all of our discussions here, which is when she said, uh, talking about one of the things she was meant to be investigating, she said, all this reminded me of a Russian saying, the real fools are not those who think they can predict the future, but those who believe they can predict the past. <laughs> <laughs> it's a sort of MC Escher uh, <laughs> saying that. Uh, we're going around and around. So uh, anyway, I'd like you to join me in thanking all four panelists for what has been a remarkable discussion. <laughs> <laughs>